the Good Friday Agreements promised that a new generation would live in peace. It gave people hope that life would be different and it was for us. I am very happy growing up in Northern Ireland compared to what it was. I think it's a great place. It was a really formative time. What we were studying in the classroom wasn't in a textbook. The deal largely ended the longest running conflict in Europe 25 years ago. I thought this is not a conflict that has got any place in the new millennium. If you want to solve it, you have to take that risk and, and talk to those who, who actually control the bond. Enemies compromised and differences were settled. This is a story of jeopardy, dilemmas and leadership. Kerry and Erin have never met before. If they'd been from a previous generation, they probably wouldn't have met at all. But they were born on the day of a peace deal. We're very lucky that we grew up when we did. Uh, after the Good Friday Agreement, I had a very happy life so far. Always enjoyed all my classes, loads of opportunities. They're in the newest cinema in Northern Ireland, in a shopping centre in Belfast, which was bombed five times in as many years. They're reflecting on scenes of bloodshed, which they have never known. Very different than, than what I would have grown up in, like two different worlds. Even, you know, hearing places like Castle Court, the Shankill Road places in Belfast, I would know and, and I've and been in in the past 25 years of my life that looks so different than, than what they do now. The crowd it's utterly heartbreaking and I think it's really, really hard to watch. Um, you just can't imagine that's what it used to be like. The conflict known as the Troubles was complex, but it was basically about whether Northern Ireland should remain in the UK or be part of the Republic of Ireland. Around 3,500 people were killed over almost three decades, until the Good Friday Agreement. I am very happy growing up in Northern Ireland. There's nothing that I think that would really put me off staying here and having a family compared to what it was. I think it's a great place to live. Having hope in my middle name, I think when everyone gets to the 10th of April every year, you know, it comes up because that's what it gave people. They, you know, hope every time, you know, that life would be different and it was for us. The first body I saw was that of a youth being carried out by other civilians with a priest in the lead, waving a bloodied handkerchief as a white flag. There were many years when hope was hard to come by, but some leaders did have ideas for a peace process. This man was one of them. John Hume from the Social Democratic and Labour Party, or SDLP, who were Irish nationalists. I honestly think that John Hume had the courage of a lion to keep going. He had a vision. The key issue was reconciliation between the communities who are deeply divided and peace and non-violence. The most lethal paramilitary group was the Irish Republican Army, which wanted to bring about a united Ireland. In the late 1980s, John Hume began initially secret talks with the IRA's political wing, Sinn Féin. Probably the big, the big breakthrough was when John Hume agreed to meet. One of the things that was crucially important was the right to self-determination, that the people of the island would have the right to decide the future. The IRA called a ceasefire in 1994. There was then a similar move by militants on the other side of the conflict, who were known as loyalist paramilitaries. The British and Irish governments opened peace negotiations with the Northern Ireland parties. The chair was the former US Senate Majority Leader, George Mitchell. I confess I was not prepared for uh, the way the talks developed. It was very controversial. I have a pass. I have a pass. And there was a lot of uh, 
insults, a lot of uh, shouting. There were dramatic walkouts. I was determined from the beginning to act as fairly and partially uh, and calmly as I could. Sinn Féin had been barred from the talks because the IRA hadn't given up any weapons and had broken its ceasefire. In 1997, a new Prime Minister came to power in Britain. Well, here we are, we've been decades in this conflict. We're approaching the 21st century. It's, it's, this, is, this is not a conflict that has got any place in a new millennium. The Good Friday or Belfast Agreement became possible because there was a new mood and sentiment, because people recognised there was no way the British were going to be able to extinguish republicanism, nor was there any way in which the Republican movement was going to bomb the British out of Northern Ireland. And so people realised that in the end, we could carry on exhausting ourselves with violence or we could reach for peace. A month after Tony Blair was elected, Bertie Ahern took over as leader of the Irish government, called the Taoiseach. The pair became a peace process double act, and they had help from the most powerful man on the planet. There is no better politician, just as a professional politician in the world, than Bill Clinton. And that was invaluable through, through this, because it, it, it meant that you had the power of the United States behind you, but not just in itself, but operating with immense sophistication and subtlety. Following the change of leadership in London and Dublin, the IRA restored its ceasefire. Sinn Féin was allowed to go into the negotiations. For the governments, this wasn't comfortable, but they believed it was crucial. You have to talk to the extremes. You know, you, you can be blue in the face talking to people who are not involved in violence, but will that stop violence? And it's, it's not easy for democratic governments and for legi legitimate sovereign governments um, to say we have to go out and talk to people who are involved in, 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 in treacherous deeds and, and military deeds. But if, if you want to solve it, you have to take that risk and, and talk to those who, who actually control the violence. The entry into the talks of the party associated with the IRA was unacceptable for some politicians particularly those whose aim was to preserve Northern Ireland's union with Britain. The Democratic Unionist Party walked out. It was led by the Reverend Dean Paisley, a Protestant preacher who was viewed by many as the embodiment of intransigence. It's stained with blood. It's surrender they want. No one should be allowed to enter the talks until there had been, um, well, my father would have used the word repentance from terrorism, but the uh, setting aside of the weapons and making sure that people were there all on the same basis, otherwise it would look as if violence paid. But most unionists stayed in the negotiations. For the first time, the parties linked to loyalist paramilitaries were talking face to face with Republican militants. As far as I was concerned, they were the enemy, um, but I also recognised that we were trying to get to a goal. I used to laugh because uh, I used to see people from other parties talking to people and then said to them afterwards, do you not know who they are? You know, these are some of the most wanted people in Europe and you don't even know you're talking to them. The Ulster Unionist Party, led by David Trimble, was the largest unionist group and took the risk of remaining. If you had come to the conclusion that the only way you could defend your interests was to physically be at the table and negotiate them, that meant swallowing a lot of very difficult things, including the fact that we had people in that building who we knew had a significant terrorist involvement, but they wouldn't have been in that building had they been winning the fight on the ground. During those momentous days, the peace process was a huge topic of conversation at my school, Sullivan Upper, in County Down. We discussed it in class and debated it in the Current Affairs Society. The year of 1997-98 was a year of expectancy and tension in Northern Ireland politics, with parties working round the clock to try and reach an agreement by the May deadline.
The current affairs team consisted of chairpersons Simon McAvoy, committee members Gail McConnell and secretary Victoria Danoon. It felt like such an exciting time because what we were studying in the classroom wasn't in a textbook. We all remember very well whenever President Clinton came to Belfast and not just because we got a day off school for that. It's um, honestly one of the most incredible things I've ever really participated in. I, it seemed to me like the whole of Northern Ireland had showed up. We got there quite early in the day, so we were right down the front. And my, you know, my dad was always really keen for these things. So we were there with a the lunch and everything else and waited there for hours. And then when he finally showed up, I mean, it's as close to sort of a God arriving on earth that I think I've ever experienced. He was just this incredible sort of charismatic guy that just held an audience of whatever it was, sort of half a million people or something, just held them in the palm of his hand. You know, that, that word hope, it felt like there was hope. Gail, you have written a couple of critically acclaimed um, in particular volumes of poetry, one of which I've given you, The Sun is Open, focuses on very personal experiences in your life that you did speak about. My own kind of personal history was that my father was a um, prison governor in the Mays prison and he was shot and killed by the IRA outside our home in 1984 when I was three and a half. And so for me, I felt like I really wanted to try to understand this, the, the kind of the very long history, the kind of long colonial history and the kind of immediate political history that had kind of created the context for my father's murder and for everything that followed. I remember you when the Sinn Féin came to where you were sitting right up the front. I remember you sitting there and I don't think you spoke, but you just listened, but I do remember you in the room. I was conscious of you in the room and I do remember you sitting there and listening to them very intently. And people still tend to sit at the front at those me meetings, which is why you, in a way, stood out. But I also was aware of your story in that sense. I'll read something from this that kind of speaks to the moment of my father's murder, I suppose, but also that tries to reckon with an aftermath. And it's sort of an aftermath that's endless, really. My father rejoices, that's what it means. My name, I mean, but did he? What, if anything, was the source of his joy? Was there joy between us, before he left, or after he walks through the hall, the squeaky door saddle, across the tiles, walking outside into the morning, into those bullets, sailing through the blue air, into perforation, into a heap, into gravel, an almost human shape, into death, into silence, or whatever comes after. The sombre difference between failure and success became more real for the negotiators in the spring of 1998. Uh, the violence was rising. There was a period of escalatory and retaliatory violence. And so I thought uh, uh, this is doomed to failure if we continue in this way. And so I developed a plan for uh, an intense final two-week period uh, and a uh, hard deadline, and uh, the parties uh, and the governments all agreed to it, and that's when I felt the first sense of hope. He set a cut-off date of Thursday the 9th of April, but with just over 48 hours to go, a deal was almost inconceivable. The main story is on Newsline this Tuesday evening. The Prime Minister arrives at Hillsborough as talks hit crisis point. I mean, I was determined to come, but there's no doubt it was a political risk. Because most people said, look, this is hopeless. You're not going to succeed. And all you're going to do is end up with egg in your face. So don't go. And there were a lot of people that said that. The, the Prime Minister delivered a up. memorable message when he arrived. A day like today, I mean, it's not a day for, for the sound bites, really. Um, you can leave those at home. But I feel that 
I feel the hand of history upon our shoulder in respect of this. I really do. But the parties were deadlocked. The sticking point was about government agencies which would operate across Northern Ireland and the Irish Republic. While enduring extreme political pressure, Bertie O'Hearn was also dealing with personal pain. My mum had died on the Sunday, but I remember on the Tuesday evening, George Mitchell contacted me and said, listen, no, this isn't working, it's not flying. We came to the conclusion that the whole thing could break down if I didn't go up on Wednesday morning. Had he not come back, in my view, uh, we, 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 we were finished. When he understood the whole point of the deal, that people had to be able to go back to their respective uh, supporters after the deal was done and defend it. Now, my mum's funeral was at 12, you know, so um, the view was I'd need to go up and meet Tony Blair at the crack of dawn um, and, th and then go uh, and meet the parties. That's what I did. I went up on that and then back down and back up again after the, straight after the funeral. So, uh, but that got things back on track. In the negotiations on the Stormont estate, nerves were fraught and sleep was scant. Pressure cooker is a pretty good description. It was very tense. People were very nervous. There was a lot of running between um, the different floors and also along the corridors, because that's where a lot of the negotiations were happening. I think the coldness was probably a good thing, because I think if, there had a be, if it had been very warm in that building, everybody would have been out, out for the count. On Thursday night, Ian Paisley wanted his say. We've got here, I ask, that you'd get up here as far as the budget. So we've done that. Oh, I remember storming the gates. I know the person who cut the chain. I saw it happen, it happened right in front of our eyes. And pushing the gates open, walking on to the estate, and marching up that hill. That mile became very, very short, with powering our way up that hill. I was inside and I was watching the news and it was Sean Paisley, so everybody piled into the coffee lounge at the top floor to look out. And I remember a, a pile of PUP members racing out, um, and they started to heckle him. Well, I wish you would walk out. While some divisions were deepening, others were disappearing. There was a deal on the issue of the new regional parliament a power-sharing assembly. There's a, a famous picture that was captured of you um, embracing a, a party colleague. That was when Seamus Mallon came down from the, from the rooms where they were negotiating and told us that they had made a breakthrough on the assembly situation, you know, on what we needed on the assembly, and that the uh, Trimble had agreed to it. And we were so relieved. I mean, I just threw my arms around him and I said, Seamus, I can't believe it. So, because that had been a very tough negotiation. The deadline passed as Good Friday dawned. President Clinton phoned the parties to press for a deal, but the Ulster Unionists wouldn't agree without a firmer commitment that paramilitaries would disarm. So Tony Blair wrote a letter to David Trimble. I thought maybe we have lost it, but then I gave the additional commitment to, to the unionists and, you know, we, we, you know, this is where David Tremble, you know, did exercise real leadership. I mean, he, he, he sold that commitment to his delegation. David came into the room and there was a lot of tension. He stood up on a chair or on a table and he said that it was his intention to go up the stairs to George Mitchell to tell him that he was going to accept the agreement. Uh, a few minutes before five o'clock in the afternoon, David Trimble called me and yes, I remember his exact words. He said, we're ready to do the business. Uh, I thanked him. I asked him if he could be available for a meeting immediately at 5 p.m. He said, I'll be there. I called all the other parties. It seemed like ages that, you know, you were just wondering and saying who's going to come through the door had a great sigh of relief when we saw Sinn Féin and then David coming in. I'm not sure if that was exactly the way it was, but they were the last two, the big ones were the last two to come in. And we thought, yes, this has happened. The two governments and the political parties of Northern Ireland have reached agreement. 
this was one of those very few moments in politics where, you know, it's a moment of pretty much unalloyed joy. So it's, <laughs> there weren't many of those, I can tell you. And I had made a point of saying to the women, we'd better hold back the tears because they would say, oh, well, then the women started crying. But actually, as I pushed back my chair, I looked up and the men were crying. However, for unionists, the mood was different. We didn't have a sense of euphoria at all. It was all very well sitting around there and clapping, but we knew we'd had to go out of that room into the real world outside where people were hurting and angry and persuade them uh, to support this. I remember seeing a copy of the Ulster Unionist piece and a pencil written down the margins was a, a notation of each significant line, Unionist loss. Unionist loss, another loss here, prisoner releases, ultimately changed to the Royal Ulster Constabulary. The fact that violence has paid to achieve some of these things. I'm confident that we will go out of here. Sinn Féin knew that previous peace agreements had actually generated blood-soaked splits among Republicans. So the party leaders didn't support the deal immediately. Welcome home, comrades. They sold it to their members, focusing on the new potential for a public vote on a united Ireland in the future. We were at pains to keep Republicans in power, that it wasn't just an elite, it was the party as a whole, the movement, the broad Republican movement. The agreement received rock star backing. U2, the biggest Irish band ever, put on a campaign concert as people were deciding how to vote on the deal. One of the things I remember was being slightly frustrated by members of the class who I deemed to be more kind of politically conservative than me and kind of feeling like the stakes for me feel higher. Mm. Like one of my father's murderers is going to get out under Good Friday and did get out of prison under the Good Friday Agreement. And I vote, you know, I would have voted if I had, a, I would have voted in favour of it. The agreement was endorsed in the referendum. David Trimble and John Hume won the Nobel Peace Prize. But at home, they were politically punished for their compromises. The absence of paramilitary disarmament destabilised power sharing. Voters turned to the DUP and Sinn Féin, which became the largest parties. There were several more years of negotiations. Paramilitaries eventually did give up their weapons. In 2007, Ian Paisley agreed to lead the regional government jointly with a former IRA commander, Martin McGuinness. It got the real extremes of Northern Ireland in the government together. That day was a very special day in our household, but it was also, I think, a very special day for Northern Ireland because they really did see a miracle, quite frankly. My main feeling as we were coming down the stairs was, I can't believe this is happening. I remember Martin McGuinness saying to, to me one time, he, he never thought he, he, he'd see the day when um, he'd kneel down every night when Ian wasn't well and he'd be saying his prayers that Ian would be okay, you know. And uh, it, it did show the journey that we had travelled. It's notable that so many people involved in this story are no longer here. Ian Paisley, Martin McGuinness, John Hume, David Trimble. The peace isn't perfect. Power sharing at Stormont has frequently been prone to collapse and in recent years it's often been absent. But political violence is now extremely rare and that's the achievement the agreement generation is passing on. The legacy is that we got peace uh, and we stopped the killing. You had leaders that were prepared even at personal political risk to face down the recalcitrant elements within their own party and move forward. And, you know, that's why it's a lesson for peace processes everywhere. We're going to play a video of two people who were born on the 10th of April 1998. Be interested to hear what you make of what they have to say about the Northern Ireland they've grown up in. Yeah, I, I'm very grateful that, you know, leaders in, in their fields came to Northern Ireland to positively drive forward the, the change and, you know, bring together both sides of, of the equation to form an agreement. I think they're fantastic. They're role models. Um, 
And I think I just hope now coming up to the 25 year anniversary that things can start moving forward again with the politics. We're a bit of a standstill at the minute. Um, I, and it would be a shame to see all their hard work be undone. To see these two young people serves as kind of a bookend for me because on the Saturday after the Good Friday Agreement, uh, as I left, there were two elderly women and they said to me, uh, thanks to you, uh, our grandchildren will live in peace, uh, which we've never had. It has a lot of meaning to me. I, uh, I love the people and the place of Northern Ireland and I pray that they will continue in peace. <laughs>